All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Nomi, for that introduction. Um, <laughs> I'm actually really, really thrilled to be standing here today. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity. And I hope that you enjoy the presentation. Um, and uh, today, uh, bef before we start, I would like you to ask you to imagine <coughs> the future of science together. And before we set off and we set our sights on the horizon, um, it's important to take a moment and take stock of where we're standing today. Because where we're standing today very much aligns with this quote here. Um, the saying is, is very common in almost every culture. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That also includes our scientific community. And I know as scientists, we tend to think that, put our faith in science and empirical evidence and data, and we'd love to believe that science is a meritocracy, where the quality of our work is really all that matters. The reality, however, looks a lot different than that. And we're going to see some examples. So once we start replacing that idealistic view of science and we become more critical, that's where we're going to get to a better science. <laughs> so the picture looks different, and this is nothing new. In the 1960s already, sociologist Robert Merton, he noticed this. He noticed that the well-known scientists often receive more credit than lesser known ones for the same work, for the same achievements. He named this the Matthew effect based on a verse in the Gospel of Matthew. And this effect now plays a significant role in the allocation of research funding. It's not a meritocracy. It's, and we see this, a few examples reveal that bias. We have the National Institute of Health that um, observed racial disparities in funding with white scientists experiencing higher success rates. <coughs> what you see here is an illustration of the current situation that we have on well, my right. <laughs> um, and that destroys innovation. Uh, versus what, how it could be, versus what we hope uh, where change would happen. So that's where we have the red ladder. This is not an isolated example. We have some of the major funders coming out saying the same thing. The National Science Foundation data between 1996 and 2019 confirms the same thing, showing that white principal investigators are more likely to receive funds than their colleagues of color. The Wellcome Trust as well admits to perpetuating systemic racism, and that's both on funding and employee uh, side of things. And uh, these are some of the biggest funders who essentially shape how scientific innovation um, how it should happen via what they choose to fund. So why should we care? Why should we care about this? And why, you know, it's the system. It's, it is what it is, right? We should care because those actions have consequences or what we tend to call mess around and find out. We have been messing around for quite a while. And now we're in the era of finding out. And I'm going to show you how some of these effects, um, ripple effects of those disparities looks like in reality. So one of the outcomes of this is uh, confirmation bias and the reproducibility crisis. Because when we're only supporting ideas that agree with our biases, we're not truly funding research. We're just 
backing up what the mainstream thinking already supports. And a lot of this thinking is built on past research outcomes, past research that hasn't been thoroughly checked or reproduced for that matter. So you're building a house on a shaky ground and you're never sure when it's going to give in. When is it going to collapse? So this approach encourages conformity and leaves very little room for innovation, suppressing groundbreaking ideas, but it also leads to the lack of reproducibility. And a clear example of this is what happened in the Alzheimer's research field. You ready for this? Yeah. So let me tell you a bit of a story that started in 1906, when Alzheimer's disease was discovered by Dr. Alzheimer, by the way. <laughs> and despite of him cautioning us to, on focusing solely on two theories of plaques and tangles, the obsession persisted. So we continued to focus on these, resulting in 20 unsuccessful drugs that were developed, costing us billions of money. The NIH that I just showed you before, those invested about 1.6 billion in Alzheimer, accounting for nearly half of the total Alzheimer's funding. Moral of the story, foster and support open-mindedness, curiosity, allow novel ideas and alternative hypothesis, and challenge the status quo. So that was just an example of how our biases can alter the course of research practices, but it also affects every stage of research. And what happens when our biases permeate the realm of AI? Garbage in, garbage out. That's what happens. These algorithmic biases have some serious real world implications. We end up with headlines like these. And let's take a closer look at the facial recognition technology because that's some one of the most common ones as, as an example. This was trained on biased data sets to start with and it showed significant Re reduced accuracy for people with darker skin tones. And that wouldn't be a problem, right? But the problem is this biased algorithms are being used in law enforcement, <coughs> in law enforcement settings leading to disrupting people's lives and disturb disturbingly discriminatory outcomes. So this is why initiatives like gender shades are so important. By creating a facial analysis data set that is balanced by gender and skin type, that way we're fostering diversity and inclusion, which in turn leads to better technology. Do you want another example? <laughs> Maybe something more related to um, our fields. That's another eye-opening example in genomics and precision medicine. So when we're studying genetic variables that cause diseases like diabetes and schizophrenia, call these genome-wide association studies. And that's where we compare like mutations, differences to biological traits. And that helps us identify genes that can raise a person's risk of a certain disease and also helps us understand how the, condi the condition itself and how to prevent it and some treatments. But these studies, they are, require diverse genetic data from multiple groups to provide the really the whole picture. So one, we need to see the whole pictures to understand where the differences are. And currently, 95.9 .9 
of the genomic research participants and genome-wide association studies is a person of European heritage. This is of today's statistics. So we are missing important information. We are missing out on opportunities of developing new drugs and targeted drugs. But there is a glimmer of hope, the good news. Um, Africa, uh, the cradle of humanity, has one of the largest genetic diversity around. And there is a, a recent project with a um, human hereditary and health in Africa, which has a global potential. So this might actually help us move forward. It might help us complete that picture to identify some pharmacological targets, some high-risk folks, some truly global precision medicine. This lack of diversity in research compounded by systemic biases in funding and led to such practices like biopiracy, helicopter research, biopiracy, uh, biocolonialism as it's also known, that involves the unjust acquisition of genetic material and uh, from uh, groups, and helicopter research, also known as academic colonialism, is the term used to describe researchers who drop in into a community, collect data, leave, without any meaningful interaction or <coughs> clear, clear benefit to the community itself. They are driven by the research agenda and what the funders support. So these examples are just a tiny peak into a much, much larger problem. There are countless more examples illustrating those detrimental effects of our biases on research quality and the huge financial losses that can come with it. So we're all, we all have biases. Yes, we are researchers or scientists, but we're human. <laughs> And whether we're aware of it or not, that's creating a divide between leaving some people behind. So what we need right now and stop to stop that age of finding out, <laughs> we need to, to correct course, to wholeheartedly <coughs> welcome diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility in our everyday practices. And there are tools that can help us get there. Tools like open science, which has been for the last 20 years championing more open, collaborative, inclusive science that allows everybody to take part. And by everybody, not just on the scientist side, but also on the participant side. So everybody to make science more reliable that helps people to build that trust in science again. It also <laughs> promotes the, uh, the principles of equitable access to knowledge to reduce knowledge gaps. And this is important in order to build a sustainable and inclusive research culture. And honestly, this is so we don't end up with situations like that where we have one of our biggest groundbreaking scientific discoveries of the century, the structure of the DNA available for only those who can. It's behind a, this corner store, cornerstone of genetic research is only available for those who can pay for it. Open science, through its collaborative nature as well, plays a significant role in capacity building. It bridges the knowledge gap, as we said, but also in capacity building by 
for instance, we have this international open science genomics project that was uh, instrumental in geno genomics capacity building in developing countries. It promoted the integrations of the researcher from countries, uh, from uh, in this case, it was African, uh, African countries into the international genomic research community. It actually helped more in learning about genomics than the actual benefit outcome from the research. So what do open science and the fair principles have in common? At their core, they're both striving for inclusive collaborative science, transparent, credible, reproducible, and accessible. And by following these principles, we open up the possibilities for enhancing diversity, uh, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and justice in our scientific practices. And these are not just words. I'm going to show you how exactly we can do that. So let's delve into this picture a bit more and, how, and understand how they shape a better present. And So but before that, I, I mean, open science and FAIR, they have things in common, but they're not the same. Open alone is not enough, because um, access to data does not, uh, does not guarantee that it's actually usable. So access to research alone is not enough. Open science has to, is complemented therefore by FAIR. FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. One of the things that FAIR promotes or actually pushes for a lot more is um, documentation. Documentation and access to well-documented research, that is a huge plus, that's a huge benefit because it allows us to actually look at the data, to evaluate what's in front of us and potentially reduces our biases. It helps us to analyze and interpret this data to enable replication and validation of the research results, and therefore it promotes transparent, reproducible science. Consider the reproducibility project in psychology, where only one third of the attempted studies could be replicated. Remember that shaky ground I mentioned earlier? That's it. We're building on top of unreplicated, unreplicable research that cannot be replicated. <laughs> and the same in cancer research. Both projects had hundreds of researchers working together. Again, underlining the significance of open collaborative science. So open, fair, and data management, they pave the way for equitable co-creation models in research. And I know people are gonna ask how, how do we do this? And I would start by the first stage of, science, of the research process where planning, good planning is instrumental in avoiding some those helicopter research practices that we mentioned earlier. And I, I cannot stress this enough, but we un hugely underestimate the role of data management plans. And I'm going to illustrate how exactly we can use it to better um, this co-creation models. So data management plans and the beginning of the research, they force us to really meticulously consider the research questions at hand and outline a very clear st strategy how we're going to answer them. So that way we can address and include some of those research questions that would benefit the community during the planning process. So both the researchers and the community can benefit from the um, 
from the outcomes. Oh, sorry. This also allows us to engage with the local stakeholders in research and encourages the community consultations during analysis, interpretation of the results. And that, that's important as well, because when we're looking at the results, we need context and we need the community to explain and accurately represent the community situation that provides this context. And when we're doing research in different settings, there, there will be different data types and we need to out outline how this data of different types from different communities will be handled. And this is very, very par particular because there might be distinct needs based on culture, ethnicity or religion or language, many things. So oh, I keep, so, ah, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead here. <laughs> So data management plans help us by having thoroughly checked what, what exactly we're looking for, how we're going to analyze the data, and who do we need to analyze the data with, and how we're going to deal with this data that's coming out um, from the research. And that's where you can also incorporate things like equitable partnership declarations. So de these are uh, declarations that clarify the responsibilities of the various people that are involved in the research. And that helps us to hold those individuals and organizations accountable for the use of data. Um, data management plans as well are the place where we outline a robust plan for preserving personal data and people's rights. This ensures that the data security, privacy considerations are integrated early on. It's not an afterthought. How you're going to protect people's rights is not an afterthought. So, and that's where we can also detail how are we going to work together with the community, empower that community to manage and take charge and make decisions about their data. That's co-creation. It helps us build that trust in science and scientific practices again, and helps build a bridge with the communities to engage in such and, and decision-making processes. Um, again, in the context of research and open science, these, these twin concepts of um, provenance and credit are extremely valuable because provenance tells us who collected it, when, how, what happened to it, how did we get to this stage, and it provides credibility, reliability of the research. So. And credit, <laughs> that's a, a pivotal aspect of inclusivity that lies in recognizing all contributions regardless of how, of their size or who provided it or the role. It helps us overcome some other types of biases like Matilda effect where the, which overlooks the work of women scientists and similar biases and, uh, impacting other underrepresented groups. But yeah, so open, fair, and RDM, uh, research data management practices, they need some proper commitment. They need substantial <laughs> commitment and effort. It doesn't happen like magic. And for that, we do need things like policies that can remove obstacles, policies that can set the tone of the new norms, making fair, open science, everyday normal science. They can also help create funding opportunities and thereby making open science fundable and rewardable and yeah. And 
policies as well help address the imbalances, ensuring equal consideration for uh, all people involved. But policies need compliance, and that's when things get tough. And it leads us to look a bit further into, well, how, what else can we do? So that's when we look further than policies into legislations. And to be honest, it looks a bit bleak, but there are a lot of legislations coming out. There is a steady increase, but the actual implementation is yet to materialize. Um, yeah. Another factor that we need, funding, again. <laughs> funding that can help us level the playing field and actually pave the way for equitable research partnerships. And funding in itself can help us establish a framework where the decision-making process is not in one hand or the other. The decision-making process giving all partners equal power. So by improving this inequity in funding and promoting diversity, we're bridging the gaps, we're bridging more gaps and, um, and we need to bridge also, it helps in bridging the digital divide by funding robust technical infrastructures. So open science ain't cheap. Um, open science <laughs> needs a lot of technical infrastructure for storage, processing, sharing, you know. But besides the technical infrastructure, we also need the human infrastructure. <coughs> Effective data management requires investment in support staff. It requires specialists that can ensure that the data can quality is good. It um, can be made available for reuse and help where needed. <laughs> and funding also can help with the um, open access publishing. That that's definitely not cheap. Um, that is actually a financial burden for many researchers and funding can help alleviate those costs by offering to a wider range of people to share their findings. And lastly, funding promotes that collaborative research. So having, because on an international especially the ones on international scale, because that, that in itself can be very expensive. So having adequate funding that ensures that the researchers can cross borders, can talk, can meet, can you know, work together, that pushes the, uh, that can transform the landscape of open science and promote collaboration. So collaboration is also rewarded. Talking about rewards, <laughs> um, what else can funding do? It can shape the current uh, incentives, metrics and indicators and assessment, research assessment. And it can do that by incentivizing open research practices and ones put in place new ones, new metrics and systems to that take into account different things than beyond just published papers. That means beyond those traditional research articles, we need to look at research data, code, workflows, models, or other things that re, uh, comes out of research. So take these into evaluation and imagine the transformation that will start once we start rewarding open and fair practices. Once we start rewarding the researchers for adopting these practices at every stage of the research, meaning that taking them into account of, um, to hiring decisions, 
career progressions, grant allocations. Yeah, that would be a real incentive and that, you know, to, for folks to engage in open science. But besides funding and metrics and policies, these are ex extrinsic motivators. That's what happens outside of us. But what happens inside of us um, or intrinsic motivation, that comes from communities. Community networks and peer-to-peer -peer interactions, they often have the biggest influence on why we do science and how we do science. Communities have this tremendous power to be for, as catalysts for change and um, pushing us further and towards more open, collaborative, shared environment. And when knowledge is put behind a paywall, coming together in communities, they provide a new a new realm, a new way of accessing that knowledge. So these spaces are not just a one street um, um, <laughs> it's not a one they don't provide a one street like communication. It's a it's a process and knowledge there is co-created. So um, but these communities don't just happen. They don't they don't just sprout out of nowhere. It's not magic. <laughs> they require a lot of hard work. And um, we can't just build it and expect people will come. We can just say, OK, I'll declare, I hereby declare this place as a community. That's not going to happen. We need to create safe spaces and environments that genuinely welcome diversity and ensure that everybody has an equal chance in participating. So it's an intentional effort. And some things to keep in mind, you're not, you're not in this alone. We are not alone in this. Um, there are experts, there are community members, there are people who are genuinely passionate and ready to put their energy into any project. So. Collaborate and work together. And this working together as well can, it's a privilege. Because volunteering to spend time and effort into a project that you love is a privilege. It's not for everybody. So acknowledge and reward the time and effort that people put in. Um, and acknowledge contributions. Um, so yeah. Commitment and investments. So don't just, you know, <laughs> we, we hear the words of equity and diversity and, but you know, it needs to be backed up. So promise to carry out specific plans and do it. Just put your resources into it and make it happen. Basically, feedback is uh, another way of ensuring that these communities are not just a bubble. I mean, um, ensuring that you know what the thoughts and experiences from your community members and you constantly learn, that might actually help you mitigate any future problems or risks that can come up. And at the end of the day, if we're getting together as a community, there has to be respect and empathy. So these are places where everybody should feel valued and understood. And that's how we truly reduce the biases to create an inclusive environment. So we don't just build it and they will come. Um, how am I doing on time? <laughs> it's okay. So to sum this up, 
um, there are a few things that we can do. Um, this is not all, you know, on one person or the other or in the system or an organization. There are quite a few things we can do on our own. And we're starting by acknowledging that we do have biases. We, we do have flaws. And just because we're scientists and researchers, we're human. We're modeled by what's in ha happening inside of us and what's happening outside of us. So take, 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 take account of your past mistakes and learn from them because we've all made those mistakes. We, at one point or the other, we've let our biases guide our choices. And it's just all part, all part of living, I guess. But once we use them to build a solid foundation, then they become valuable lessons and not just mistakes. They're not failures. They're, they're there to help us build a stronger foundation. Oh, sorry. Um, embracing diversity. Um, I mean, the whole talk is about that. So what I'm trying to say here is, is it's not just something that happens. It's not just something to, that we tolerate or some, no. It's actually something that we have to celebrate and strengthen and it's our superpower and it will add value to us. Um, and as a person, recognize your own privilege and role and understand the impact of that comes with that position um, and leverage it to, to make, you know, to make better decisions, to uh, change decisions and to empower others and bring them on board. So amplify the voices of those that often go unheard. Um, as I'm saying this, I'm also saying shift the burden of change because don't expect marginalized groups to lead those efforts for you. It's time for all of us to step up and don't put it on just one group's shoulders. Um, embracing the values of open science and showcasing that it works and you know it's it's a culture it's an opportunity um, and build new habits for fair I, I mean what you do in your daily life and every hour while you're documenting in your lab notebook or your electronic lab notebook it has an impact that is way bigger than your personal use and it's not just a one-off task it's, it has to be a continuous deliberate effort and and you have it and so yeah <laughs> remember that open and fair are tools open and fair are tools that help us to build those mechanisms to create a better future for everybody This dedicated change is, um, is also needed at higher levels. Um, we've seen a lot of performative actions. <laughs> we've seen a lot of, yeah, open, fair, diverse, but that's not going to do it anymore. And we need a truly strong desire that is backed by systemic changes. That's where organizations play a big role and they need to start by acknowledging it, acknowledging that there are entrenched issues and the first step bef before <laughs> making any real progress. Um, commitment to change, as I said, um, just do it. <laughs> um, implement review processes, you know, listen to what the people want, don't just um, um, create um, solutions that you imagine would work out. So, and implement those review processes to also identify any barriers that might be holding you back. So, 
what are these barriers that might be an issue? And once you've you've uh, found it, you're able to to start solving it. So you might delve into changing your policies or hiring practices or shifting your the culture. So there's so many things to do. <laughs> Um, yeah, reflection, it's an important part of growth and, um, building a, a culture and building a community that's is based on the culture is a strength and that's, will add an overall value to, to your efforts. Um, yeah, feedback mechanism. Um, risk management systems, um, how are you going to deal with potential risks? How are you going to deal with violations of code of conduct? How are you going to do this? <laughs> and I cannot stress this enough, but stop expecting marginalized groups to solve your problems or to lead those efforts. And there are experts. So invest in expert consultations and ensure that you know what's happening. Um, supporting open and fair practices. Um, it's not just advocacy. It, as we said, we, it requires quite a bit of funding, quite a bit of money, and it needs the support of policies, the investment and in humans and, and technology alike. And yeah. So, and that, that needs to be taken into consideration. So with these 10 simple rules, what you can do and 10 simple rules of what the organizations do, um, let us have a fresh start. This year, NASA and the White House and other federal agencies, they've uh, announced 2023 as the year of open science. So that's our fresh start with that initiative, let's build a stronger foundation to the future where scientific exploration is expanded for the betterment of all humanity. And uh, as a freaking nerd, <laughs> um, let's embrace the beautiful Vulcan philosophy that appreciates beauty, growth, and progress as an outcome of the unison of the, un of the unlike. Infinite diversity and infinite combinations. So let's welcome a future of open and fair science that knows no bounds. With that, I um, want to thank my team at the Life Lab and at Fairpoint and all the organizations. And I'm done. <laughs> take some questions from the audience. I don't see any questions on Juno, uh, but if anyone sees one, please relay it to, to me so that I can know. So um, questions. Sarah, um, great talk. I had a question about one of the things you you kind of mentioned policies and legislation. Now, you know, first of all, open data and uh, like different countries have different everything related mm -hmm. to this. And like how, you know, I don't know if you've worked with people who are thinking about this, but how do we bring that together to have this united federation of open data? <laughs> What would Picard do? <laughs> what would Picard do? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we do have policies in, in different places, and actually the problem is the lack of policies of certain places. A lack of policies in Africa and other continents, like in Latin America, that's a huge problem. Um, so... It, <sighs> How we align our policies, if that if I understood your question correctly, is a matter of looking at our practices and what we want to achieve, but 
and making it work between reality and visions. Um, right now we have policies that like the um, European da data directive, which is coming out and saying, yeah, open data from public research has to be shared openly, but they've hit the pause button. So even, even if you're lying and I, where, what's, where is that going to get us? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, hi, great, great talk again. Um, so um, you mentioned uh, uh, helicopter research and um, specifically biopiracy, and this has been very topical in the last year with all of the COP and uh, Nagoya negotiations on digital sequence information. So I was curious what your thoughts are and where you stand on that, and how, how do you balance, you know, keeping data open and not um, uh, holding back biodiversity research and, and, and data reuse with actually giving the biodiverse and the, these communities like the, the credit that, that they deserve. So let's look at why researchers such as African researchers are reluctant to share. It's not just about putting uh, policies in place. There is a trust that was broken. And that's why you need to have other measures to build up trust. You need to have collaborative work, you need to have provenance, you need to have credits. So it's it's not about just the policies, although the policies are a problem um, or the lack thereof, but it's essentially the trust. And we've seen this with the African researchers being hesitant to share their COVID data because we don't understand the context, we don't understand that um, why they don't want to share it. The, we don't understand the political context that comes with sharing this data, and there's a lot like the whole picture. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I, uh, there was a consortium for the COVID for the Africa. There are two science papers published, and the data is already available. So everyone contributed to this. I think the major obstacle for all of this is funding, not really collaboration. There are people who are keen to share data, and but the production level is not so high as well as you as one expects. Mm. Funding is a major issue, yeah. I think. Um, funding moves things around, so I'm just going to spare you the <laughs> dancing. Hi, Sarah. Great talk. Um, you mentioned research assessment. Um, do you know Dora and Koara, and what's your opinion on that? Uh, I don't have an opinion, to be honest. <laughs> I'm not too involved, but I'm hoping that it's uh, done, taking into account like um, different roles. Um, we have a lot of emerging uh, roles in uh, in science. I mean, as data managers, uh, we weren't there. We weren't around ten years ago, so <laughs> I think it just needs to to align a bit more with what's happening new. Yeah. Uh, I find it sad that we still have to talk about this. Yeah, <laughs> um, checking agree. our privilege is something that we've learned, but everybody else in this conference has still not learned, I think, even. So do you have any advice for people who maybe are suffering burnout? <sighs> <laughs> Just to be blunt about it. <laughs> um, so there is a certain burnout that comes with uh, tokenization, and that's why I kept saying don't expect marginalized groups to lead the efforts don't expect us to do our job and do a, a, another full-time job on top of it so um learn learning to respect boundaries of, and respecting in terms of laying the the, the onus of, of the work on on people um 
<coughs> and re re rewarding that that work as well goes a long way. Um, God, I, I, <laughs> if I had a, a proper answer for that, I, I would feel much better as well. <laughs> Hey, hi, I'm Bavesh, and again, wonderful talk, and I, I hope it reaches way beyond this, this room. Uh, I think you, you mentioned something about engaging community, yeah. and uh, I, I don't personally do data collection. That's not my background, but I was wondering if some, there's a project, let's say, it's collecting data in different ethnicity to have a balanced data set. I think you gave an example where that wasn't the case, but then there was a project that were trying to do that. Uh, what's the approach to community engaging, engagement, sorry, uh, uh, because there's not always a clear community representative, right, for different uh, ethnicity when you're collecting data and so on. So what's kind of the, what's your vision or your, your uh, advice for community engagement when there is no clear uh, representative for certain communities, which could be very much the case, I can imagine. So if you're working with data from a specific demographic, work with researchers that belong to that demographic and engage them. So don't just interpret the results without, without approaching someone who's actually from that demographic. And I, and, and I think the difference here is like when I talk about com communities or things like uh, carpentries, uh, open life science, and you know, there things that is came out of grassroots uh, initiatives and work. Um, but what you're talking about here when it comes to the data and the analysis of the data is actual co creation, which means that you work with the researchers that belong to that place. 